Hey everybody, this video is going to be a response to some of Trent Horn's comments in this interview that he had with Austin Suggs at Gospel Simplicity. Let me just explain how this came about. I'm, I'm doing research on the papacy over the last uh, six to eight months, and in the context of that, I just made a video on a critique of the papacy in the third through seventh centuries. So I'm, I'm researching, reading. I went back and watched this interview, and I found myself in the context of listening to it thinking, how would I respond to that argument? And so and I kept thinking that through to the point where it's like, well, why don't I just make a response to this? Because I actually think sometimes on YouTube, uh, Protestant perspectives are less well represented. Uh, sometimes there's just less Protestants speaking to these things. Protestants ignore these conversations a lot. And sometimes the Protestant voices that are out there aren't necessarily the most winsome or, or helpful or capable ones. So I thought it might be useful for people just to hear the other side on this. This is done in a spirit of respect. Uh, Austin is a friend of mine. I emailed him and asked him if he would mind if I did this. And he very graciously said he, he wouldn't mind. <clears throat> and then uh, for Trent as well, I, I Trent is a very smart person and a very he makes very reasonable arguments. So none of this is coming in a at, a at a personal angle, but more just wanting to engage with his arguments and out of out of a concern for the truth of these things. And especially as there's so many people I know who are wrestling with these things. And again, sometimes not hearing the Protestant side. Okay, so I'm going to dive right in. I'm going to try to go quick. I, I am going to skip around a bit because I want to try to hit the main points. So um, please, I'm not trying to, to ignore anything. If I miss something important, if I skip over something important, let me know in the comments. I'm not trying to kind of snipe at something by just plucking it out of context. But I just have to, I don't want this to be a three hour video. And I want to try to hit the main points. And there's some points we agree on. So it's not as worthwhile to address those. I'm going to put it into 1.25 speed. So hopefully it won't be too fast. Um, and I'll think I'll just dive right in. I just jotted down a few introductory notes here. But that's I think that's it. Thank you to all my patrons. Thank you to everybody who subscribes to my channel and shares videos. It means so much to me. It, it encourages me and, and enables me to do more of this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, we're going to start here at about four minutes in. This is a point of agreement for us. Is at the center of many of these divides. But how important is this? Well, I think it's really important, Austin, because it goes back to the question of authority. So what is a Christian's authority? Who do we go to or what do we go to to understand the truth of God's revelation of what God desires of us? Do we go to scripture? I think all Christians would agree we go to scripture. Where we disagree is, do we go to scripture alone? Is scripture our only source of authority when it comes to God's revelation so that we have scripture and then we have other human beings and their varying opinions about scripture? Or do we have the authority of the apostles that existed in the first century uh, do we have that authority continuing today in some form? So I really do believe the papacy is the most distinctive doctrine of the Catholic faith. And if you type in Catholic in Google, I'm sure like one of the first things, it'll Google Images. Like the first thing you're going to get popping up is probably, it's probably the Pope. I, I did type that into Google Images to see, and he's right. <laughs> first one is the Eucharist, and then there's a bunch of pictures of popes. Um, <clears throat> I do have a worry about a caricature of Sola Scriptura already here. I just hear this over and over. If I could make a plea, and then I'll make a plea for Protestants. But a plea for Catholics engaging in these conversations. Could you try to engage some historic Protestant views on Sola Scriptura? I continually hear this idea that like it's the Bible's our only authority or we're just going by the Bible. Sola Scriptura is much more nuanced than that. One basic point is it's not just about the Bible is your only authority, but the Bible is your only infallible authority. And that's a huge distinction. But that'll come up more later. So I'm going to save that. I just want to basically say state my agreement with the basic idea here that the papacy is really important, okay? Um, and that the way Trent put it is, it's a matter of the authority in the church, not just a matter of the structure of the church. I completely agree. This came up, that was one of the ways I put it in a dialogue with Joe Heschmeyer recently, also on Go Austin's channel, Gospel Simplicity. Um, and then he, he goes on after this to say, basically, don't so I'm going to skip over this so let me summarize where we agree on what he's saying because I don't want to take minutes and minutes and minutes here but he's basically saying don't misunderstand the papacy by thinking of it as this autocratic person just laying down dictates he's a pastor over the church he's a shepherd over the church and that is a well taken point that Protestants should remember also don't think that papal infallibility means that the everything the pope says is infallible okay this is another point where Protestants often caricature Catholics on this. Uh, so, and I see this a lot in the comments too. So Protestants need to understand 
papal infallibility does not mean it, it only applies under certain conditions when the pope is speaking in a kind of ex cathedra way in this official way over the whole church so protestants we need to be careful about that all right i'm going to skip ahead a little bit here does it kind of create this so solid foundation in which you have that and then everything else is good or does it create a potential house of cards in that if the papacy claims to have infallibly validated certain things if you can pluck any one of them the whole house falls. Does that make sense? No, I think I see what you're saying here. The idea is, is the papacy... By the way, I think this is a question that, this is something Austin and I have talked about. I think it came up in our discussion. So it's interesting it comes up here. Um, this house of cards argument, by the way, I don't raise this argument as, a, as an argument against the papacy. Like, you know, what if the Pope says, I raise it as an appeal to try to help my Roman Catholic friends understand my dilemma as a Protestant. So I say, imagine if the Pope said something and it was an ex cathedra statement and it ran clearly afoul of what you believe orthodoxy to be, what would you do? Now, I know they will say, well, we don't believe that that can happen, but it might, if you just imagine it as a hypothetical, it might help you understand what the Protestant's dilemma is. So I raise that as kind of a, a way to help someone understand what Protestantism is, not really as an argument against Catholicism. But here's Trent's answer. Asset to the Christian faith, or is it a liability? You know, the idea is that we say that the Pope is infallible. Well, we've got, uh, as of now, 2,000 years of Christian history. What if we determined uh, that a Pope made a, you know, a theological error that would show he's uh, fallible here or here? Uh, you, you know, the target is very wide. But I would say that's not unique to Catholicism. If you make, I think many Protestants would, could understand this. Think about the Protestant claim to compare the papacy, especially papal infallibility, which we'll talk about later here in our interview. I think one good thing to compare it to is the doctrine of biblical inerrancy that many, not all Protestants, but many Protestants would say, well, the Bible is without error. But then what do you do when you have an atheist who comes along and says, okay, so you believe the Bible is divine revelation because it's divine revelation, it's without error. Is that a house of cards? What about like you go to some atheist websites, let's say there's thousands and thousands of alleged contradictions, and that could kind of shake a Christian's faith and he thinks like, oh man, I believe the Bible and I believe it's without error, but what about all these these, these arguments that are out there? And actually, Austin, what? This would be just another point of agreement real quick before we get to the more substantive things, but the house of cards appeal is not unique to the papacy. Now, what is different for the scripture and the papacy is the papacy is an ongoing office. So you're bound not to uh, a, a deposit that has that is currently completed that can be sifted through and analyzed, but you're bound to, as C.S. Lewis put it once, whatever the Pope might dogmatize. And so all the discussion right now about a fifth Marian dogma, um, yeah, I mean, it, what, whatever is said, you're bound to that. So there's, there's a difference in that way, but even that isn't really necessarily a problematic difference from the Catholic standpoint. So. I'd say I agree this house of cards appeal is kind of a, it, it's not really an argument against the papacy. It, 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 what I raise it for is to simply say, understand the world through my eyes, understand how I'm looking at it as a Protestant, understand what my dilemma is. You have respect for these institutions that have developed throughout Christianity, but you think one of them has kind of gone off the rails. If you thought that, can you under, and then, because what I find is a lot of the other caricatures of Protestantism tend to fall away not all of them, not all the disagreements certainly fall away, but some of the caricatures about like, do Protestants believe in a visible church? That'll come up in a second. Those kinds of things tend to fall away um, to some extent, at least, if someone is making that more sympathetic effort to try to understand a Protestant on their own terms. But so again, not a lot of disagreement so far. Let's press ahead. Like, like my chain of reasoning would go something like this. And this is how it was for me during my conversion almost 20 years ago from non-religious <laughs> to being Christian. I said, look, all right, I believe there's a God who's out there. And I look at the New Testament like if it was just historical documents. Maybe there's some true things, maybe there's some false things. But I can look at these documents and say the best explanation for the origin of, of the Christian church is that a man named Jesus of Nazareth walked out of his own tomb. If he walked out of his own tomb, I'm going to trust what he has to say. And from what I see from that evidence and then shortly thereafter in Christian history, this man gathered together apostles who had authority to form a visible church, a visible church with a hierarchy. The word hierarchy means sacred order. And so as this church flourishes with a hierarchy that people look to, that in the early church, people didn't look to the Bible. In fact, the Bible was still being compiled and assembled together. They looked to the bishops to see, all right, is your bishop, can he trace his lineage back to the apostles? Okay, let me just jump in real quick, and then I'll let it keep going a little bit further. I, 
the general way, the general like uh, order of reasoning there that Trent has, I really like of starting with the resurrection, building outward from there. But let me just comment on this issue of the visible church. Not everything I'm about to say is just related to what Trent said, but I see this so often and I think it needs clarification. So what is this idea of a visible church? Okay, first of all, the basic distinction between visible and invisible, I think is utterly indispensable, utterly non-problematic, something every Christian on earth can agree on and something that would obtain even if there were no divisions in Christianity. The, the adjective visible should not be over freighted to do too much work. It's making one specific point. Namely, there's an aspect of the church you can see, there's an aspect of the church you can't see. It doesn't mean there's two different churches any more than believing in the church triumphant or and the church militant means you think there's two different churches. You're just looking at the one church from two different angles. The distinction between visible and invisible goes back to St. Augustine in his On Rebuke and Grace, chapters 20 and 22, where he's basically saying there's a sense in which Judas Iscariot is a part of the church. There's a sense in which he isn't. Again, I really don't think this, this idea needs to be controversial, and um, it certainly wasn't the basis for the Reformation. Like, the Reformers never came along and thought, so in other words, there's, there's, you, there's a church you can see, like you can go to the secretary's office and say, can I see the membership roles and see everyone who's been baptized? You count it up and at one particular congregation, there's 251 people who are members of that church. You can count them, you can see them. But then we say, but that doesn't necessarily correspond to who are actually God's people. The, the, peop, you know, the Lord knows whose hearts are his own. And that is a, a, a valid definition of the word ecclesia, as it's used in various passages of scripture. That's a valid distinction to, to say, this is one aspect of the church, this is another aspect of the church. What this isn't is uh, the basis for the Reformation. The Reformers didn't come along and say, because I hear people talk like this, as though the Reformers were saying, well, there's the invisible church, therefore we can separate from the visible church which is a total caricature of Protestantism. Protestants didn't think, Protestants believe in the visible church. We believe the Holy Spirit protected the visible church. All we deny is that the Roman Catholic church is the exclusive instantiation of that visible church today. We, we can even say they're part of it. So like Luther said, the Roman Catholic church is corrupt, but she's still holy. She still has the word and sacrament. She is still the church. He said that in the 1530s, Calvin, uh, said the Roman Catholic Church is not the one true church, but there are many true churches within her. So not everything I'm saying right now is against Trent, but I think that this just comes up so much where there's confusion about this difference of the visible church and the invisible church. That's not where our differences lie. The differences lie, in, and I even think the Catholic Catechism has categories similar to that, uh, when it's talking about the, it uses the language of visible and spiritual. So, but, and it means something at least close to that, but that's not where the differences lie. The differences lie in what is that visible church? How do we identify her? Um, now I've addressed the issue of apostolicity in, in, in my video uh, on the papacy in the first and second centuries, where I argue from the church fathers. I think it's very clear the church fathers, they did not mean by apostolic mainly succession of office. Succession of office was a part of that, but it served a larger end of succession of doctrine. We know that because many of the church fathers said explicitly, if you have succession of office without succession of doctrine, that is only as good a succession as uh, uh, death succeeding life, or illness succeeding health, or a tempest succeeding calm. That's Those are images from Gregory of Nazianzus, but Augustine and many others said the same thing. So I don't, I don't, but people can see my fuller comments on that issue there. The only other thing I want to say right now, Trent's comments about, and this is another area I have a concern about caricatures of Protestants, as though Protestants thought like the Bible is what we look to rather than the church or something like this. Um, or I think there was a comment made there about the early church looked to the church leadership rather than the written scriptures. Like the, the early church wasn't looking to a Bible. And I have a worry about a false dichotomy here. Of course, I would say apostolic authority in both oral and written forms was looked to at every nanosecond of church history. As soon as anything was written down, and, and there's traditions going back early, 
So Paul calls, uh, Paul's writings are called scripture by Peter in the New Testament in 2 Peter 3.16. The, the letters of the apostles circulating, those were authoritative. There, there's questions in terms of canonization about the edges, like which, you know, there's fuzziness around the edges, which books are in, is Revelation in, is the Shepherd of Hermas in, those get, those take time to develop. There's not generally dispute about like, if you're living in like 150 or 180 or 210 AD, I don't think there'd be any dispute about like, is the gospel of John authoritative over us? Is the epistle to the Galatians authoritative over us? Of course it is. So the early church did look to the scriptures and of course to the Old Testament, as we call it. Um, it's not an either or. It's about they look to the church and to the to the written documents that would become scripture. Um, I, I'm guessing maybe Trent and I would agree on that, and it's just a matter of how he worded it there. But you know, I just think it's and and I'm going to do a future video on Augustine's view of authorities in the church. It's amazing how far he is, I think, from contemporary Catholic views. So that video will come out soon. But let's keep going. And then the only question remains: Do all of the successors of the apostles have uh, the same authority, or does one of them exercise a different kind of authority, just like one of the original apostles, Peter, exercised a different authority? So I don't see it as a liability any more than many other claims Protestants believe in, like biblical inerrancy. Rather, I see the papacy as being something that, that provides unity in the church, uh, doctrinal understanding, and for and I guess one last thing I would I would put forward is just kind of a common sense argument with the papacy would be this: when you think about you know, I believe the church is not an invisible union of believers. Now, there's one view of the church is just, well, everybody who believes in Jesus, that's the church. It seems clear to me in scripture, the church is a, a visible, enduring entity, an organization, if you will. So okay, that goes back to what we were saying just before, visible and invisible. Again, it can be a both and. There are passages that use the term ecclesia, specifically to those who receive the saving benefits of Jesus Christ. Um, so, but, but it, even if you don't, agree with a Protestant construal of the invisible church, you, we still need to recognize Protestants believe in a visible hierarchical church that is protected by the Holy Spirit and never goes apostate, never dies. This is such a hallmark emphasis of the magisterial reformers over and against the radical Anabaptists. The church never died. The church was preserved in every generation. I, sorry, I, uh, but if somebody wants a bunch of quotes on this from the early reformers, my book, Theological Retrieval for Evangelicals, chapter one is all about that. It's all about what was the Protestant attitude toward earlier church history. So sorry to reference my own book. So if God is God's organization on earth, uh, so if the church has that, think about human organizations. When I think of human organizations, the successful ones always have one leader where the buck stops. You know, there is, do you remember that? Did you ever watch The Office? Uh, a little bit. I haven't got Okay, well, so there was an Sure, sure. There's an episode of The Office where uh, Michael Scott and Jim, this is in the later part of the series, where they serve as co-managers. So they're, they're both in charge of the branch at the same time. And it just leads to chaos, having them both involved. And, and Oscar says, oh, of course, why wouldn't the company have, why wouldn't the branch have two managers? Uh, you know, what would America be without two presidents? What would Catholicism be without the popes? Uh, that even in earthly organizations, we see a leadership structure that culminates with a single individual exercising authority and leadership. So to me, if that makes sense among purely human organizations, how much more so would it make sense among an organ among the church that Christ has established? That to me would also mirror, and we'll talk about this later in the interview, uh, that the church is the analog to Israel. That when God established Israel, it had a similar leadership structure of uh, both in the, the, the older covenants and the kingdom of Israel of a single individual being a mediator or leader uh, that, that's established to lead God's people. Um, okay, I, I love the show The Office. I, I remember the first time I watched this interview, I was actually thinking of that exact episode and that moment before Trent said that. <laughs> so uh, it, it's that's a funny episode. Um, on, okay, that's a this common sense argument is really interesting. I mean, in general, I have a little bit of hesitation for this if it's put forward too strongly, because in general, the argument from kind of what works or what we see generally to the church, I think is kind of precarious, but Trent isn't really putting it forward real strongly like that. So it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing to think about. I think I would just observe that it, it kind of seems to me like a double-edged sword. Um, so like in general, if you just look at like how leadership is done in organizations and institutions and bigger entities like countries, nations, um, the, the general thing will be the smaller the band of leadership, 
that is ultimately in authority, the greater the efficiency, the larger, the greater the accountability. Um, and that's why for a lot of companies, you will have like a CEO or something like that. And then you'll have a board, a plurality of people. The board will have certain decisions that they alone can make. And there, you know, you can see all different models of this, but they're, they're part of the reason for this is people see there's actually, again, the double-edged sword, there's some downsides to having such efficiency, such power. Um, so like an example would be like in my context, I, I, as a Protestant, I've come up into this in the context of discussions about what's the ideal number of elders at a church. And the general way of thinking is you got to find that happy medium uh, because too many will mean nothing gets done. Too few will mean it's kind of topsy-turvy and, and it's, uh, you worry about, uh, you know, if it's just like you got two or three elders, it's much easier for them to uh, not have as many eyes on a problem, make a mistake, something like that. So that's the general principle. So then you ask, okay, so how does this apply to the common sense argument? Well, while having one person at the top is a common pattern in many institutions, though not all, it also is one that often runs institutions into trouble. A lot of times what happens is it works for a while and then things kind of go off the rails. Think of like the way that the Roman Senate changes once you start getting a single emperor and the way that plays out over the next couple hundred years. And basically the Protestant perspective would be that having one person on the top, yeah, there's some common sense appeals for why that has some value. There's also some real common sense worries for that. So I'm not arguing that. And I would say, you know, part of the appeal of, well, you have one person on top, this can guarantee unity. Can one person has the authority to sort of, you know, convoke an ecumenical council and, and enforce something. But only for the people who are under that person's authority, anyone outside of the Roman Catholic Church, we would regard Vatican I as the biggest barrier to unity, and the Orthodox would as well, because that's never going to be accepted. So the double-edged sword is the you have greater power, but that power can then be misused. So that's not an argument against the papacy. It's just a sort of flag or check on this common sense appeal. It's like, let's be careful with that, how far we push that. I, the main thing I want to say is on this appeal that there's in the Old Testament that the papacy is somehow consistent with the Old Testament because there's always been one person on top. That sounds good, but the moment you start getting specific, I think it starts to fall apart. Well, who's the one person on top? If you're talking about the king of Israel, that actually undercuts the appeal to Isaiah 22 from Matthew 16 and Eliakim. These are two different people in a, in a different function. You've also got the high priest. That's the more regular ongoing office that's sort of always there. The, the king comes in not in the ideal conditions in 1 Samuel 8. Uh, and it's not necessarily a good thing that the people want a king, though God grants that desire. But the main thing, so there's like different offices you could maybe compare the papacy to, but the papacy is not comparable to any one of them. The responsibilities of the pope, as defined by Vatican I, are significantly different from any of the responsibilities of any of the single individuals uh, throughout the Old Testament who are over this nation. You know, every, every nation had a king or most nations had a king in that place. That's why they wanted one in 1 Samuel 8. So, you know, like none of the Old Testament offices had the ability to speak infallibly, for example. So the papacy, I would say, is not consistent in any specific way with God's general ways of working throughout the Old Testament. It is an innovation or a new development. Okay, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here. I just edited out a commercial, but um, there's been some discussion now about Peter's authority in relation to the other apostles. And Trent has been talking about Matthew 16, Matthew 18. Here's the main parts now where I want to offer a response, but I'll try to let him lay out his case and then I'll respond. With Peter, and I'll just kind of be brief with this and we can explore that if you want to go more in depth. But, but for me, when you look at the New Testament, it's not just clear to me, it's clear even to many Protestant exegetes that Peter had unique authority uh, within the early church. And among okay, now note that word authority, unique authority. So the claim here is not of just a general leadership role in some way, but one that has, where Peter has an authority that the other apostles do not have. That's the specific nerve center of the differences, because everybody thinks, I don't really know too many people who wouldn't admit Peter has a leadership role of I mean, it's just obvious throughout the Gospels. The question is, is it 
a leadership role as understood by our Eastern Orthodox friends, and as I would understand it as a Protestant, basically under the heading of first among equals. So he has a leadership role, but there's no qualitative difference in terms of authority between Peter and the other apostles, or is it not that? That's the question here. So let's listen to Trent's arguments and then we'll interact with them. Amongst the apostles. Uh, some key elements would be that he's mentioned more than almost any, than any other apostle, even all that put together. Uh, he's almost always listed first in the apostolic lists. Matthew 10, 2 even says, uh, it talks about the list and it says, uses the word protos, Peter, and in lexicons, what we see from that is that it's not talking about Peter as first in a numerical list, but like chief, chief is Peter in Matthew, Matthew 10, 2. And of course, the last person in the apostolic list is Judas. And so we see there that the, the list, most of the apostolic list, almost all of them are arranged. So you have the least important apostle, Judas, and the most important one, Peter. Uh, then, of course, there's the traditional text in Matthew 16. Peter's name is changed. He's the rock. And I, and I know there's a lot of debate. I talk about this in my book about whether what it means is Peter the rock, is he not the rock? For Protestants who say, well, Peter's not the rock, Christ is, my question is, why did Jesus bother to change Simon's name to Peter? Like, that's my question to Protestants. It's like, okay, if Peter's not the rock, the church is built on, why would Jesus go through all this trouble to change Peter's name? Like, that's my question. Why did he do it then? If Peter doesn't have special leadership authority, because when you look at the Bible, whenever God changes somebody's name, the name itself is a sign of their new mission. So when Abram becomes Abraham, Abraham, he's the father of many nations. That's his new mission. And it's the same, I would say, with Peter. Uh, okay, this was the part when I was watching this, I, I was thinking, okay, let me think about how to respond to this. And I thought, this is when I thought, maybe I'll make, a because this is the main stuff I want to respond to. But maybe I'll make a video about this. Um, Peter's name being changed. Okay. James and John also have their names changed to the sons of thunder. Jesus is clearly giving, and, and actually that's interesting because James and John, this is something I never quite understand is why Peter is singled out uh, as one versus the 11 in terms of a uh, difference there. But J Peter, James, and John are not as much as three versus nine in terms of a difference there. Because James and John actually are singled out. I think there's a, 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 sim, a comparably good case you can make that in a lesser, to a lesser extent, James and John with Peter have this kind of, they're in this sort of inner circle among the 12. Jesus often, like during his transfiguration and many, many other times will pull those three away. And as we said, their, their names are also changed. Jesus can change their names to give them a new mission, to give them a new identity without that meaning something that would lead you to the papacy. I also think the issue of Judas being listed last and Peter being listed first falls significantly short of establishing the point at hand of does Peter have greater authority? Judas did not have less authority than the other 11. The problem with Judas wasn't that he was a sort of junior apostle or something like that. He was a full apostle. He was just corrupt. You know, we know, we know what the problem with Judas was, but it wasn't a, a lesser degree of authority. The other thing I wanted to comment here is the reference with the rock of Matthew 16. And I hope this is not being unfair to Trent. I know what it's like in your when you're just responding in the moment. You're probably not giving the fullest case you could give for something. So I don't mean this as like a strong criticism so much as just wanting to interact with his perspective on this and let, throw out some new thoughts uh, from the other side. But if I understood correctly, uh, Trent was just mentioning sort of two possibilities for the rock. It's either Jesus or Peter. And uh, thinking of the Protestant view being that it's Jesus, that Jesus is the rock of Matthew 16. But I did a video on, on the papacy a while back, and I went through a number of the church fathers and pointed out the three main interpretive options for the meaning of the rock there. One is Peter, another is Christ, and the other is Peter's confession. And the interesting thing is that most of the church fathers think it's polyvalent, meaning it's multiple of those two things, or sometimes all three. A lot of them think it's his confession. My single greatest encouragement for people watching this video, if you want to um, see a Protestant viewpoint on the papacy, is do a deep dive on the church fathers on Matthew 16. It's really interesting what they say. John Chrysostom would be a great example of the kind of person who had, he, is very nuanced how he talks about it, but certainly he does not think it is anything less than Peter's confession. He, he quotes the verse and then he says, the rock on which I will build my church, that is on the faith of Peter's confession. Um, my general observation for my research on this, though, has been how poorly supported the Roman Catholic view is among the fathers on Matthew 16. And the reason is uh, 
they're all affirming, almost all of them affirm it's polyvalent. So it's like Peter's confession and Peter or something like that. But the logic by which they say it's multiple of those things is um, generally speaking that it's not about Peter, okay? It's about what Peter is doing. So Peter's, in other words, if the rock is Peter and his confession, it's Peter because it's his confession, if that makes sense. So like, here's how Augustine put it. Augustine's final mature view is that Basically, he says, Peter is acting as a representative of the entire church. He said, Peter called after this rock represented the person of the church, which is built upon this rock for the rock was Christ and confessing who? <clears throat> as the whole Christian church confesses, Simon was called Peter. This is why you got a lot of fathers saying like Origen says, be a rock like Peter. Now, I'm not trying to say that this is simple or that you should just go with one of these views among the fathers, but I am trying to say First, we've got to make visible all three of the main options for the interpretation of the rock. Second, we've got to see, let's probe the logic by which it could be multiple of those. And I would simply say that the Roman Catholic view um, that is uh, dogmatized in Vatican I is, I think, really, really a, a difficult one to maintain. I'd also say the same thing for the keys. I've done a deep dive on this and been astonished how many of the church fathers say expressly the keys. So in Matthew 16, Matthew 18, the keys are Matthew 16. The binding and loosing is Matthew 18 um, and Matthew 16. So people say, well, all the apostles had the binding and loosing, but only Peter had the keys of the kingdom. But church fathers, I think were, I mean, I, I, I'm, my knowledge is not encyclopedic. I don't know every church father, but Pretty much everywhere I look, I find the fathers there. I'm sure there's some exceptions, but I find Cyprian very expressly stating all the apostles have the keys. I find John Chrysostom, the beginning of his sermons on the Gospel of John, talking about John the Apostle as a possessor of the keys. You find late patristic thinkers like Isidore of Seville and Bede summing up earlier patristic thoughts, saying the keys were shared. This was the common patristic view, I think, that Peter had a leadership role, but nothing given to him was qualitatively different. Nothing was withheld from the other apostles. He had it, again, in the kind of first among equals way. Now, Trent goes on from here to give a Galatians 2 argument. Where he calls it the, the even Peter argument. I think it's a well-made appeal. I think it would be stronger, though, and more conclusive if there was something in the text that, you know, it was explicit like this, where Peter, where Paul is saying, even Peter I oppose to his face in Galatians 2. Or... Um, even Peter, the possessor of the keys, or even Peter, the vicar of Christ, or something like that, I think that'd be a stronger argument. I also would say that with Galatians 2, it's tough to imagine something like that playing out today. And you wonder, um, do, it, are there the same guardrails for papal authority today as we see in Galatians 2, where the Pope can be openly, publicly rebuked like that? I, I'd say, practically, I don't know that I really see that. Uh, but the last thing I'll say on this is what he's about to get into here is you shouldn't be Protestant until proven Catholic. And I agree with that. I think we should take both options as, you know, don't be anything yet until you're sure, you know, study the evidence. Now, there's a lot more you'll have to believe in as a Catholic, actually, because there's just a lot more that's required that's that's been defined as a part of the gospel. So in that sense, the, the um, decision to be Protestant or Catholic will be a little uneven in a certain respect, but I agree we shouldn't be Protestant until proven Catholic. But let me let me skip it ahead here. Uh, I wanna get to Austin asks a really good question about the development of the papacy. Let's let's watch this. And it's not, but how much of the modern papacy do we need to see in Peter? Because, and again, this kind of comes up in that Walls argument as well. Sure. But is there is there room for a development? Because I think at least as a Protestant, you know, looking on from the outside, if you will, what I see in right. the, say Clement or someone, seems pretty far from what I see in Gregory or going down the line of this more temporal power right. of these things. How much of, what exactly do we need to see in Peter and the early popes to say, papacy sounds like an original thing? This is a really good question. It's what I just made my two, two videos on, the development evolution of the papacy in church history. I think Austin's question was more about church history I would have been really curious to see what Trent would have said about that. He's going to kick it back to the Bible, which, you know, it's a valid point, I guess, because that's even earlier. But I would have been curious what he would say about like, yeah, from Clement to Gregory, how do you how do you kind of uh, navigate those differences? 
but um, l let's let's let Trent answer and then I'll respond. Well, I think that what we see in Scripture that unique authority is given to one of the apostles, that the apostles were not treated as having equal authority amongst each other and then appealing as a group on issues or even appealing that amongst them to uh, decide as, as a majority together than as if they all simply had equal voices. So I think the fact that one of the members of the Apostolic College was given unique authority over others uh, and even to be given particular uh, protections or charisms when it comes to teaching. Uh, that's why I, I think for me, uh, I didn't know if I was going to get to this. Uh, well, I was going to jump to this a little bit later, but I might, I might as well bring it up now. Uh, when we look at Luke chapter 22, verse Okay, so he's going to go to Luke chapter 22 before he gets into, this is a, one of the, I think, one of the more compelling arguments that our Catholic friends can make is from Luke 22. Before he gets into that, just a, a final comment here again, we're still at this issue of, is there unique authority for Peter over the other apostles? Um, I, I would say just another passage that we've got to wrestle with more, and this is not a criticism of what Trent said, but just a general comment in these discussions, because you never want to criticize someone for not saying something, you know, it's like in a discussion like this, it's not going to, my comments won't be exhaustive either. But Acts 15 has to come up. I mean, this is the great doctrinal controversy of the early church in the first century. You've got Peter there, you've got the apostles there, the presbyters at the church of Jerusalem. And it just is so evident to me that you, you don't have Peter functioning in some way that could be resonant with the vision of Vatican I. All the apostles come together, all, you know, eat, several contribute, and then James makes the final judgment, therefore it is my judgment, verse 9, verse 19, excuse me, verse 19. I don't even think that means James is in authority over above the rest, but if there's someone who does sort of speak more definitively, it'd be James. So that'd be another passage I'd say, again, just wanting to push against this. I don't think we have any reason to think Peter had greater authority over the other apostles as opposed to a more first among equals type leadership. But Trent's going to make an argument from Luke 22 now, so let's listen to that, and I'll let it go for a couple of minutes here. This is uh, 24 through 34. To me, I find this to be very powerful evidence for uh, what we talk about with the modern papacy, seeing it in incipient form in Scripture amongst the apostles. So when you look here, it starts, what people miss at Austin is that in most modern Bibles, there is a header that separates the last two verses from this discussion, and you lose the context. So in Luke 22, 24 through 29, Jesus is, there's a dispute among the apostles about who is the greatest among them. So you would think, oh, well, this, this leads us right here. You know, we're talking about, is there an apostle who has authority over others? And some Protestants will read this as saying, oh, well, Jesus didn't say Peter, and that's that. But, but you know Jesus, when he teaches, he never puts things just point blank to people. He leaves them a way to, to enter more deeply into the mystery. So he says, because they were saying, who among them is the greatest? And he says to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship uh, and authority, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, as the leader, and the leader as, as one who serves. So it's saying, he doesn't deny there's a greatest among them. Rather, what he says is, you guys, with your authority, you're not going to be like the Gentile kings. You're not going to lord it over people. And then when we, so he says, rather, you're going to serve others. And what's interesting, you go back to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm sorry, in the, sorry, beginning of Peter's first letter in Scripture, he's, he tells people to clothe themselves with humility. He, he speaks with humility in his own letter, isn't important, and he calls himself a fellow presbyter or a fellow elder. So he says to them, you have continued with my trials, my father, as my father appointed a kingdom for me, so do I appoint uh, that you may eat or drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So the apostles sit on thrones, one of them is the greatest, and then in verses 31 through 34, this is where usually there's a head. That disrupts the flow. But then if we read that in the context, Jesus tells Peter, or he says, Simon, Simon, Satan demanded to have you all, that he might sift you all like wheat. He's using the plural you. But I have prayed for you, singular in the Greek, for Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. So, so for me, I, I see very powerful evidence going back to the New Testament uh, of seeing this idea that Peter has unique leadership authority and also a spiritual protection that is designed to provide support and protection for his brother apostles. And so for me, we then see that unfold as the church understands the office of the successors of the apostles, the office of the bishop, and the bishop of Rome. Uh, well, oh, one more thing, I guess. I'll let him get to that next thing, but first I want to respond because he's going to move on. So just to respond to the Luke 22 stuff, I definitely think this passage in Luke 22 
is a powerful argument for Peter having a leadership role in general. Okay. He, it's, it's a well-made appeal. You know, you take away the header, just keep reading through the Greek, the original Greek, and you notice the difference between the singular and the plural there prayed for you specifically. Um, the problem is to strengthen your brother. So the problem is getting a unique authority being given to Peter, or as Trent puts it there, a special kind of protection over Peter. I mean, this episode takes place in relation, and this is the same with John 21 as well, the feed my lambs passage. This takes place in relation to Peter's denials. Um, Jesus is basically saying, I've prayed for you in relation to that event. When you've turned back, strengthen your brothers doesn't mean you have authority over your brothers. Um, so to get, it's like, here's how the feeling I have when I hear these arguments from Luke 22 and John 21. It's like, you've got the, the evidence here and the evidential burden you need here. And they're kind of being pulled arbitrarily together. So you need to get like all the way to, uh, you know, Peter's in authority over the church. He's the, kind of the pastor over the church. He can speak infallibly, these kinds of things. That's what you'd need to see, to see like the papacy, unless you're going to really bank on a developmental model, which I know some people do that. But it, to the extent that you're arguing that Luke 22 gets you like to something that's resonant with Vatican I, with the vision of Vatican I, um, I just don't see it. Like there's nothing in the passage. Like here's a good test. If you were to take 10 people who'd never heard of anything about Roman Catholic or Protestant or anything like that. They were completely ignorant of church history. And you just gave them Luke 22. Would they, how many of them would come away with something that would be consistent with a Roman Catholic interpretation of this passage? How many of them would think Peter has authority over the other apostles? How many would think Peter is this special grace of, of you know, the Holy Spirit protecting him and that kind of thing from, uh, to, to, so that he can protect the rest of the church? Um, in some kind of ongoing official capacity. That's just not the, uh, 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 I, I would guess zero, I'd guess 10 out of 10 would read it as more just, no, Peter's about to deny Christ three times. Jesus is praying for him in the midst of that event. And he's praying that when he turns back, he would strengthen his brothers. Doesn't mean all, you know, this larger structure that's built out of that passage. So that's, that's, I guess, my concern of where I feel like some of these passages are overworked to try to get to the evidential need. Comes the modern papacy and the nation one. I remember once reading a Protestant apologist who was saying, you know, we see people, we see Pope Francis in the public field, and people are waving their arms and they're 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 shouting at him. He's driving through St. Peter's Square. And he said, I couldn't imagine St. Peter being like this in the first century. Like, you know, we make the Pope out to be someone like this. I couldn't imagine seeing this in the first century. But if you read the book of Acts, it says that when Peter walked down the street, people would line up on the street just to have his shadow fall upon them so they would be healed. And the author of Luke's never the author of Luke never says this is a superstition or rejects this idea he doesn't it's not it's not condemned it's a passing detail to show i mean i don't even know anybody who tries to get pope francis's shadow to heal them today <laughs> but this idea that that, that that detail reminds me of that like wow there, there were people who wanted to see peter when he came by just like people want to do the same with with the pope today even even more so so i'm sympathetic to the concern like well is the modern papacy like the the first century papacy i just think we should extend that to other things like the first so on, on Peter's shadow, I mean, I think this is one of those areas where I sometimes feel like Peter is singled out in a way where it's like, yeah, but this Peter was not unique in this way. Paul's handkerchiefs are, are also used as an instrumental means to bring healing to others who are sick later in the book of Acts. If you let all the data roll in, what you see is um, the things, the ways in which Peter is at work. In fact, I actually think it's one of the themes of the book. I actually think that this was an intentional thing on Luke's part where you have so many miracles uh, that are conducted by Peter are then also conducted by Paul. It's a really interesting thing. And some of the commentaries on Acts have noticed this. Now, I don't think Luke is doing that out of any kind of the concerns we're talking about now in terms of you know relative authority. I think he has his own purposes for that. But the point is I, when all the evidence rolls in, I don't think you see Paul, Peter above the other apostles in any kind of authority, qualitative authority, authoritative way first century view of scripture, view of the church, a view of the incarnation of the Trinity and allow the doctrines to develop over time. So would it be fair to summarize that? And I, I don't want to mis-summarize it, so please let me know if this is incorrect. But that we don't need to sure. see a full-fledged doctrine of the papacy in the first century. We need to see 
that Peter and his successors have some type of unique authority, and then we can allow that to like, kind of move and seed, developing into a more full-fledged doctrine. Is that, is that too minimalistic, or is that about right? Well, there's different ways to go about understanding uh, the development of doctrine on this issue, but I would just compare it to any other doctrine that we believe. I mean, in, uh, was it the, the 6th or 7th century, centuries after the time of Christ, the church was defining doctrines like the monothelite heresy, the idea that it was declared a heresy that Christ has only one will. Uh, that if you go to, I'm sure, at Moody Bible Institute and others, and you do your Christology class, you know, you'll go through the different Christological heresies. And one of the later ones is monothelitism. The idea is, well, no, if Christ has a fully human and a fully divine nature, then he needs to have a fully human will and a fully divine will. Uh, to, to under, you know, but however, I would say, like, where is that? We, we pronounce that as heretical to deny it. It's an important part of Christology. And Christology developer, like when you read the Council of Chalcedon and its discussion of Christ's human and divine natures, you don't see a similar any similar kind of discussion like that in the New Testament. But you see important affirmations that Christ is called Theos. He is called God. Uh, he has a unique relationship with God unlike any other prophet. And so I would say we see the same thing we would occur with the understanding of the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the papacy, that we see that amongst the apostles, Peter has unique leadership authority over the rest of the church. Uh, he's given special protection to lead the church. And then number three would be what he is given is an office. All the apostles are given an office. Okay. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll let him finish that comment in just a moment, but just the difference between the papacy and monothelitism is that the papacy is not just a doctrine. It's not just the understanding of the nature of Christ that unfolds. And then it's mid sixth century. You get this dispute about does Christ have two wills or one wills. And it's understandable that that wouldn't necessarily be up, up front, you know, certainly uh, when you have a doctrine that Christ is both human and divine, it's totally acceptable, understandable, not surprising that the understanding of that is going to unfold over time with greater nuance and clarity in relation to heresies that come up, especially. The papacy is not just a doctrine, it's an office in the church. Like when we look at American history, we see there's George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. You can see them. The, the office of the president develops and changes in many ways, but there's no doubt there they are and they're functioning as the president. Um, Monothelitism and the papacy are apples and oranges. I, I don't get these, these developmental arguments from the papacy. I mean, especially if you go after Peter, because Peter is an apostle. So the whole thing is, does Peter's role transfer in some way to the Roman bishops? So then you're saying, then you're looking at the evidence for subsequent Roman bishops right after Peter. And I don't think there is good evidence that there were even single bishops following Peter for a few generations, and then, um, uh, you know, one or two generations, and then sometime early second century, you have this structure spreading more and more and more a monarchical episcopate throughout the church. But however you understand that development, it's a fundamentally different kind of development than something like Christology, because you can look back and say, there's the Pope. You can't look back and say, there is monothelitism. It's the understanding of a doctrine that's unfolding. So I think um, it's understandable to say the papacy can develop in some respects, but um, gosh, you need to see more. You need to actually at least see popes doing pope-like things. <laughs> you know, you need to see some popes like pronouncing theological verdicts to resolve disputes, pastoring the church, you know, like, where is that in the late second cent in the late first century, second century? It's, you just don't see even there being a Roman bishop, any evidence of that until you get well further down the line. And then as I've argued in my later videos, once you do have one, I don't think they function in terms of Vatican I. So uh, the, 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 the papacy, monothelitism, I just see those as apples and oranges but especially Peter, to endure until Christ comes again. Uh, in Acts one twenty, after Judas commits suicide, uh, the apostles cast lots to select his replacement, and they, they quote the Psalms, and they say, they quote the, the Septuagint version of the Psalms, the Greek Old Testament, and they say, let another his office take, which in Greek is, let another take his episcopate, or episcopate. Literally, I think in... Um, like the King's English and Victorian English would be translated Acts 20, let another his bishopric take. So an understanding that uh, Peter has this authority, he's a, you know, he has the charism to protect him from teaching error and strengthen his brethren, and that this is bound up within an office, an office that is meant to endure until Christ comes.
I have never quite understood the relevance and maybe I don't want to be unfair to Trent here. Maybe he, maybe I'm not grasping what he's intending in terms of the relevance of Matthias in Acts 1. The replacement of an apostle is different than apostolic succession. So, it, you know, having one apostle gone and so bringing someone on as a new apostle, Matthias, to replace Judas, that's different than any kind of transfer from an apostle to a bishop. Those are two. Now they might both be right. I'm just saying they're different, and so I'm, I I struggle to understand what is really the point here with Matthias in Acts one. Uh, I just see that as something we all agree on. Now the one thing I I would observe about Matthias in Acts one is that the specific rationale in verse twenty two, for and and throughout actually, for his uh, appointment, is among other things that it says one of these men must become with us a witness of his resurrection. You see, the apostles were witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. And then the other thing is they were witnesses of his earthly ministry as well. That's why they say someone who's been with us from the beginning. But, and that's why Paul is an apostle. He's a witness of the risen Christ and his encounter on the Damascus road. So apostleship was a redemptive, historically unique office. The, the authority given to apostles was played this kind of foundational role at the start of the Christian church. This is one of the reasons why I would say if you're going to say that apostolic authority has an ongoing reality in the church, you need really good arguments for that. And it'd be just like if someone said, I have Mosaic authority, or I have Davidic authority, you need a really good reason to accept that. Or in a secular context, if there's a CEO who retires and someone else says, I'm the next CEO, you need a really good reason to think that that's right. Now, that's kind of a bigger can of worms, and I've made other videos about apostolic succession, so I'm just, that's just, I guess just, if you don't like that, forget that. That's kind of more of a general comment here, but it comes up with Matthias in Acts 1. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to um, Trent and, and Austin are talking about apostolic succession and Ignatius. I made a whole video on Ignatius, so I don't want to get into that too much here, but he does talk, make one specific appeal from Ignatius I haven't addressed before in videos, so I want to let him do that and then address it. And this is when they're also talking about, they, they've, I'm skipping over some stuff about apostolic succession in general to get to papal succession specifically. So let me skip ahead here. Maybe even if the apostles gave their authority to successors, why would Peter's authority in particular go particularly to a successor? And I would look at that both in uh, the biblical evidence and historical evidence. Biblically, when Peter is given the keys to the kingdom, I would say that that is an allusion to Isaiah 22, 22, uh, when Jesus says, what you bind... Uh, well, you know, what, what you bind, no one shall lose, what is loosed, uh, no one shall bind. Uh, in Isaiah 22, 22, it talks about how the prime minister of the kingdom of Israel who served under the king, it said to this prime minister, the key of the house, I give you the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. So what I see here in Matthew 16, and that later church fathers recognized, is that Peter's role as, as the pope, we can almost call him kind of the, the prime minister of the church of God. So it's kind of like you had in, in Israel, you had God as the king. There was the king of Israel, like David. And then you had a prime minister or a vizier that oversaw the kingdom on behalf of the king. So I would say that in the New Testament, we have Jesus Christ is our king, and the pope serves as kind of a prime minister or vizier that oversees the kingdom on his behalf. And so I would see that both in the biblical evidence and then the historical evidence, like when you go to Ignatius of Antioch, and we may talk about this a little later um, when we talk about uh, history, uh, Ignatius seems very clear. Like I know what the Orthodox say about uh, the Rome being having a primacy of honor, but he, in his letter to the Roman church— and he's just so clear that the Roman church is, is unparalleled to any other church. He says to them, you preside in love over the other churches. That would be in about 110 AD. So he says the Roman church presides in love. And that word presides in his letter to the Magnesians, Ignatius of Antioch uses the word only to mean an official like leadership capacity. So I guess, sorry for the mouthful of an answer, but that for me gives me pretty solid evidence for uh, Petrine primacy and its transmission through an office of something like papacy. No need to help. Okay, so just to address Isaiah 22 first, I do think that Isaiah, this is again where um, as I'm reading Joe Heschmeyer's book, as I'm reading, as I'm listening to, I, I've been on my whole journey here learning about Catholicism, lost a lot of caricatures, learned a lot, but I'm, I would say I'm a challenged and changed Protestant. I have great, even as I'm making this video, I feel this kind of tension of like, oh, I don't want this to, to kind of stick at Catholics in, a, in, a, in the wrong way. I have great respect for Catholic friends and for the Catholic tradition. And, and I also would say, 
there's a lot of arguments they make that are a lot more uh, plausible than many Protestants give credit for. So this whole argument from Isaiah 22 to Matthew 16, I think is very plausible that this is forming the background context to a large degree, if not exclusively, for the meaning of keys, binding and loosing, et cetera, in, in Matthew 16, and then also some of the Jewish usage of those terms. What I wouldn't agree with is that it's the exclusive background context. So the image of keys, of keys, excuse me, does have a broader biblical context and meaning. Like, I think it's in Luke 11, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees at the very end of that chapter, and he says to them, you have taken away the key of knowledge. There's all kinds of usages of that imagery of keys that will also need to be dialed in. But I would simply say, I don't think Isaiah 22 is the background gets you to something that would be supportive of an argument for the papacy. Again, it's like these, these arguments from the triangular structure of the Old Testament, especially when you see how the church fathers understood the keys, it's just tough to know like, well, okay, which is it? Is it Eliakim or is it some other? Because Eliakim was not the buck stops with me type person. Um, and there's just too many differences between the papacy and the role of Eliakim to make that kind of an exact parallel. But I would say, I think Isaiah 22 is certainly should inform our, our interpretation of what the keys are and what binding and loosing means. On Ignatius, um, I would just say, I, I think this language of presiding in love is ambiguous on several different levels, such that I find it a very weak argument for the papacy. There's no mention of a Roman bishop anywhere in that letter. It's just talking about the Church of Rome. So already that kind of raises some curiosities. This, maybe there's an explanation for that, but it's kind of odd. Um, but the main thing is, what does that mean to preside in love? The word preside is used twice in that initial paragraph to the uh, of the epistle to the Romans. First, it's just talking about a regional presiding over the region of the Ro Romans. Now, he says a lot of praiseworthy things about the church of the Romans, but he says a lot of praiseworthy things about all the churches. He calls the Ephesian, Ephesian church deservedly most happy, being blessed in the greatness and fullness of God the Father, predestined before the ages of time that it should be always for an enduring and unchangeable glory. He says of the Smyrnian church that it has through mercy obtained every kind of gift which is filled with faith and love and is deficient in no gift, most worthy of God and adorned with holiness. You can see all these kind of, how do you, I would just encourage people watching this video, go read Ignatius's epistle to the Romans and see if you can pluck out, unless you were looking for it in advance, would that phrase, uh, presiding in love or presiding over love, lead you to think, oh, the Roman bishop has authority over the other bishops or anything like that? Again, it's that feeling of the evidence is here, the evidential burden is here, and they're getting pulled together to meet the need at hand rather than something that would spring naturally from the texts or from the evidence in question. I'd also observe in passing that the word, verb preside, this is just an interesting point of fact, the same Greek verb is used in the Shepherd of Hermas 1.2.4, to refer to the presbyters in the Church of Rome, okay? Shepherd of Hermas, second century text, maybe 140, something like that. Presbyters in the church presiding over the church. That's pretty interesting. Um, okay, last issue is infallibility. I'm going to let you hear Trent's answer on this, and then I'll respond. Even like this high view of Peter, I, I feel comfortable with, but is that is that a stretch, I guess? is really the, the reservation to me that that feels like it might go... I guess the thing is, it feels like it's going a little far. And, and how would you respond to something like that? Sure. Sure. And what I would say is I would look at it, um, I would compare it to other senses of infallibility to not make it seem as alien of a concept, and then look at the biblical and the historical evidence. So to compare it, I would say, well, what is the doctrine of papal infallibility? It teaches that when the Pope, when he teaches under specific conditions, he is protected by the Holy Spirit from binding the church to error. He could still be a sinner, a brave sinner. We've had some whoppers in church history. Uh, he could even speak theological error if he's not intending for this to be a formal pronouncement for the whole church. Uh, so if it's under these limited conditions, he's protected. And I would say there are parallels to this kind of infallibility. First, I would say that um, I would say Protestants believe in just the general idea that, that, that as Catholics, we believe in the census fidelium, that the faithful as a whole will not uh, fall away from the faith, that the Holy Spirit protects the census fidelium, the faithful as a whole will adhere to the church. It doesn't mean there won't be large numbers of people to fall away, but the church as a whole will be protected by the Holy Spirit. And I think Protestants would agree with that as well, that the elect, those who are going to heaven, they will not follow up. They have this kind of protection. Uh, then moving to the bishops, we would say, well, 
if you believe in apostolic succession, so if you're Orthodox, I think you would say that the bishops as a whole, now you might get another bishop here and there. I think the Orthodox would agree, however, that the bishops and patriarchs as a whole are protected by the Holy Spirit from uh, leading the church into error. Though that becomes unwieldy because without a central figure to unite them, it's very difficult for all of them to teach in unison. That's why it's been very, very difficult for the Orthodox churches to hold a pan-Orthodox council uh, without a single patriarch being able to, to unite all of them. So I think that if you see also in scripture, I mean, if someone says, well, how could a pope be infallible? I might ask a Protestant, do you believe that Peter, when he wrote first and second Peter, was protected from writing error in those letters? Well, yeah, sure, of course, because most Protestants believe in biblical inerrancy. Okay, so what, so what Catholics would say is that Peter, if you were ever to make any other similar pronouncement, would be protected from that, from error. And his successors, who would make any similar pronouncement, have that protection. So I'm, I'm building a bridge out here to show that it's not alien. And then if I did the biblical evidence, looking back at Luke uh, 22, 34, 24 to 34, as I mentioned earlier, and then also the historical evidence, especially in the early church, uh, I would just say to our, our Orthodox brothers and sisters, when you when you look at, I think some of your questions actually deal with this, I won't go into it with too, um, too fine detail, they really speak about Rome, the Roman See, the successor of Peter, as having a special kind of charism or protection that they don't say about other apostolic sees like Jerusalem or Constantinople. It, it seems that the early church understood, as St. Cyprian said, that Rome was the seat of unity, and there was something special about this see that safeguarded the unity and protected it from error. So I guess that's, I would compare the doctrine show it's not alien uh, to our understanding of other senses of infallibility, and then look at the biblical and the historical evidence. So thank you. And that the, the first part of his answer there, where he's just teasing out this, what does it mean to be infallible and trying to draw, build bridges to other ways we understand that, no no issues there, well-made appeal. And he's right that we shouldn't think of infallibility as this like alien, bizarre thing, you know. So that's, we're all good on that. Um, and I don't want to be unfair here because I know he just unpacked a very brief argument, but I still want to respond to what he says about Cyprian there. Now, because I've looked into this and I know that this is a point of contest between not only Protestants and Catholics, but the Orthodox and Catholics, but gosh. Um, so it's true that Cyprian sees the See of Rome as a source of unity. And he has very praiseworthy things to say about the See of Rome. As I've said in my videos on this, people can go watch my critique of the papacy from the third to the seventh century. This is the first of the five episodes I recount there. Uh, Rome is looked to as a source of, you know, kind of this bastion of Orthodoxy, this kind of flagship church that's kind of, you know, um, See, this is where Peter and Paul were both martyred. It grows. It's a large, prominent church as you get into church history. Uh, they survive persecutions early on. It's, it's a remarkable church. It's also the capital of the empire. So it's got this practical kind of authority and weight in that, in, in that way as well. But uh, I, I just think it's so clear. So, so Trent is raising this in relation to the connection of points of infallibility. That's the topic here. And Cyprian does expressly deny that the, the uh, Bishop of Rome has authority over the other bishops. And I want to just tease out kind of how he's thinking or what, what is the context for that when he says that, because in his book on the unity of the church, Cyprian is explicit that the other apostles, I'll just read this quote. He says, the remaining apostles were necessarily also that which Peter was, endowed with an equal partnership, both in honor and of power. And Cyprian looks to Matthew 16 as a charter for every bishop, not just for Peter specifically. So then there's the contest about how to respond to, to um, you know, what are valid baptisms after the Decian persecution, and I covered that more in my video. But basically, in his letter to Stephen, uh, to the current Bishop of Rome at the time, Cyprian makes it clear that Peter does not have a kind of primacy. The, the see of Peter does not have primacy over the others in the sense that there's authority there or that it is infallible. And we know that because basically Cyprian and also his uh, one of his fellow bishops, Firmilian of Caesarea, who is writing a letter to Cyprian about this episode, they, they both think of Stephen as in this in his kind of official pronouncement on this matter as not only falling into error, but Vermillion actually accuses him of schism. He, called, I mean, again, sorry for the offense of this, but he, he, he talks about Stephen's pride. He talks about his, um, his kind of stubbornness. And then he says, I'll just read what he says. He says, Stephen is introducing many other rocks. So think of Matthew 16 and laying the foundation of and building up 
of many other churches. That's not a good thing. So that's what, and he speaks of Stephen's stupidity as well in this episode. Now, sorry if that gives offense. I know what it's like when you, one of your, someone you respect is criticized, but I'm just trying to say that the early church didn't think of Rome as infallible. And you, that's very clear. That's very clear throughout patristic church history. They didn't say, oh, well, Rome has spoken, therefore it's settled. Um, and this is just one episode of that where <laughs> the, the other bishops resist the edicts of Rome and are quite happy to say. So when Trent Horn says the early church understood there's something special that safeguarded the church of Rome from error, I would just say I disagree. I don't, I don't, I think the testimony of the other bishops is very clearly in the opposite direction. All right, the rest of this video is questions from the audience. So I'm going to pause it there so this doesn't go on too long. Now, let me say in conclusion, if I violated any YouTube etiquette, I'm a relatively new YouTuber. <laughs> I'm within my first like seven or eight months, and I don't know, always know the if I violated any etiquette here in the way I interacted, if I should have played the whole video or something like that, forgive me and also let me know that I did that. I hope this video has been helpful for people. I know that there's a lot of people who are watching YouTube videos such as this one, and they just don't ever hear a thoughtful Protestant side. And I don't know how thoughtful mine is. I hope it's somewhat thoughtful, but I, at least it's a Protestant, at least it's something, you know, because a lot of people are only, what a lot of people are doing is they're comparing their experience at a particular Protestant church to like the church fathers, <laughs> and then layer on some Trent Horn and some other Catholic answers, apologetics, and they're just not hearing the Protestant side. And at the very least, I think it's good. Hear both sides. Here, you know, get, let it be a fair fight. Hear both sides in it. So hopefully this video can play a role in that way. Thank you for watching. Hope this has been helpful. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you'd like to uh, stay in touch as more videos like this one will come out. Thanks for watching. God bless you.